The next session at Exola's Developer Summit at GDC 2022 is Beyond Credit, taking advantage of emerging payment methods worldwide. Berkeley Agnes is Exola's Vice President of Marketing. Jurgen Avena is Exola's Business Development Manager of LADAM. Roy Corinne is Exola's Director of Strategy. Zachary Schrut is Exola's Business Development Manager of the US. And Sebastian Sichos is Exola's Business Development Manager of EU. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. We're thrilled to have this panel up here of industry experts and specialists from around the world. We're gonna talk a lot about payments, um, what it all entails across all of their geographies. So payments used to be simple back in the day. You'd go to the grocery store, you would check out, cashier, you would put all your merchandise up there and cashier would go cash, check, or charge, right? But today in video games, distribution is happening in lightning speed. There are multiple geographies around the world, things changing all the time, and they all have their preferred payments um, and localized way of doing things. Now with credit cards, there were credit cards, PayPal, uh, Google Pay, Apple Pay, alternative payments, digital wallets, the list goes on and on and on. It's not so simple anymore. And we've heard from a lot of you um, in the industry, you wanna reach more players in more geographies around the world. So let's get started with a simple question. Everyone accepts credit cards around the world, right? Maybe. You know, a global pandemic has changed a lot. In 2018, we've had about a third of all the global market use credit cards around the world. That number, two years later, increased about 48% and is north of 50% today. How does that impact in the credit card usage um, pro and processing translate to each of your geographies? Hey, Jurgen, let's start in Latin America where you represent. Perfect, and thank you for everyone for being here. Feels good to be here in San Francisco after so long. Um, yeah, the, the credit card market share is increasing in many, many territories, and it's actually quite simple to start accepting international credit cards like Visa, like a MasterCard. The thing about local brands is like CUP in China, JCP in Japan, these actually require local partnerships, and Brazil is actually a great example of what I mean. There are several example, there are several local credit cards, excuse me, such as Elio, Hypercard, Aura, that are only processed by local acquirers, as you can see up there. Another thing to note in Latin America is, is that you won't actually be able to provide installments for your users without a local partner, and people, um, and people actually are used to paying in installments for almost everything, even if they just go grocery, grocery shopping. Basically what that means is users can actually make payments, make installment payments for in-game items that cost like $10, and basically this will mean that they can split their payments into 10 equal parts, receive their in-game items, and then keep paying that um, each and every month, getting what they want. Let's kick this over to Sebastian and Roy and start with Sebastian in Europe. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. It's really good being back at GDC after such a long break. Um, so, you know, even if we just look at MasterCard or Visa, uh, it's not really that simple, right? Um, uh, you, you, you want to make sure that you work with a local credit card or with a local provider in Europe, right, that, um, you know, um, can ensure a better conversion rate. Uh, because they actually work with the local banks uh, that issue the credit cards that the that the players use or to pay, um, and there's also a better chance that they actually um, follow um, you know any uh, local regulators' policies. Uh, for example, 3D Secure 2.0 was just recently uh, implemented, uh, started in Europe but expanded into other regions as well now, um, and this is now a must. So if you're working with a provider that is not capable of working with that technology, uh, your transactions won't go through, and you know, I think we can all agree on that that is a bad thing. Yeah, just to add to that, like, uh, yeah, the world is full of credit cards, but I actually want to maybe change gears and talk about things or payment methods that are not credit cards, and, and we must not forget that not every customer has access to credit cards, and customers really should be able to pay the way that they want to pay. Um, India is a good example. Um, you know, local payment providers in India, like, like Rupay, um, have a larger, much larger actually, market share uh, compared to traditional credit cards, to so Visa and MasterCard, and we must not ignore that. So if, if you guys are planning on launching in India, then you need to make sure that you can provide more than just credit card support. Local, 
local credit card or local payment methods in India, for example, also they're often backed by the government and, and they can provide better, better terms. Um, and these better terms translate into discounts or, or cashback opportunities that can be passed directly to the end consumer. So this is why um, many people actually use alternative payment methods in India. Um, those cashbacks, just, just to give you a sense, can, can reach up to 50% um, of, of, of the purchase in India. So it's definitely incentivizing. Now combine these payment methods with users that have already historically been using alternative payment methods in India, um, and they can account for over 50% of, of the gaming market in India, which is over 400 million people. So again, when, when transacting in India, that is a very significant way to uh, reach additional audience. Hey Zach, what are your thoughts coming from North America? Uh, thanks Berkeley for having me. It's uh, great to be back in the Bay, um, really missed it. Uh, but despite you know, all this conversation about alternative payments, it's uh, very hard to really figure out the payment provider for credit cards, uh, seeing that North America is still very focused on that. Um, some of the things that you want to kind of think about when choosing your car, your, your payment provider would be, uh, does that provider provide most of the existing brands? Um, what are those uh, regional pricing? Because, uh, you know, from region to region, region, to region uh, it really changes. And um, the, one of the, the most important things, actually, that Jurgen brought up was making sure that local provider also has uh, the support for local credit card interfaces. Um, you, you don't want to forget uh, some of the payments that come with uh, credit card and, and the processing part. One of the big things, and, and I can assume a lot of people here really don't want to deal with, is chargebacks and refund fees. Um, it's not really a lot of fun. If, if I, I think everyone can agree on that. No good, exp yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, this will all ensure your maximum conversion for all your tra uh, credit card transactions. And, you know, it allows you to expect and know the costs that are going to be coming through it. Um, though you shouldn't, you know, really focus on credit cards, it shouldn't be the end-all, be-all strategy when it comes to your global payments. In our experience, we found that a lot of countries have very unique payment landscapes, uh, very unique payment methods and, and habits. So if you want to decide to start selling your game there, um, you're going to have to consider this, Berkeley. Absolutely. Great comments all around to get us started here today. Um, what do you actually mean by unique payment landscape? I mean, what does that mean to developers and to this audience that's out here today? Um, this time, let's start, uh, go to your home country, Sebastian, in Germany. Yeah, sure. Always happy to talk about uh, the home country, right? Um, you know, it's, Germany is, uh, of course, one of the biggest markets in the in the EU um, in terms of revenue, and it includes video games. Uh, but historically, credit cards have not been very popular in Germany. Um, I, I think you know there's quite some change happening in that regard. Um, and also, you know, um, I mean, I've been using credit cards for years now. And um, you know, Mastercard, having lost that antitrust case last year uh, against the EU Commission, probably lower fees coming in, so acceptance rate should go up. So I expect to see uh, more credit card usage going forward. But it's still, when you look at the data that we saw with the last 12 months here at Exola, um, it was still only 10% of all transactions that went through with credit cards. Um, so you can see that the market is still um, heavily digitized by other um, payment methods, like so for Giro Pay or mobile payments. Um, and we actually have a very similar situation in Poland, you know, or neighboring country. Um, people there historically were also not really eager to use credit cards because the acceptance rate simply wasn't there. Uh, you know, web shops and websites just simply didn't allow pay people to use credit cards. So naturally, they turned to um, you know online payment or um, you know bank payments. Um, and now we have a landscape um, with a with a vast network of uh, local banks in, in Poland. So out of that. Uh, we now have the most popular payment method that, that basically came out of that. It's called Blick, which aggregates all these local banks and lets people simply and securely pay for whatever they want to buy, including video games. Hey, Jürgen, let's, talk, let's extend that conversation to Latin America. Sure. Uh, when it comes to Latin America, it's very difficult for, for users to, to, for people to get credit cards in Latin America because it's 
there are so many like bank regulations that make it so hard for for them to comply. So it's very important, at least in Latin America. I know we've been talking Germany, India, but in Latin America, it's very vital to have all these payment methods because one thing to notice too, not just the banks, but a lot of these people that are paying for these games are under the age of 18 who don't really have means for credit cards. So it's very vital to have a lot of payment methods that really allow you to just open up and pay through cash payments, bank transfers, uh, mobile payments. Um, most of them, from what we've realized from our experience, is that most of them and use 30 percent, uh, more than 30 percent, don't even have bank accounts. So that's that's something that Exola really thinks about, and that's that's the target that we're going for. Um, for example, in Mexico, we have seen that it has led to cash payments and prepaid cards like OXO um, that you can buy with cash in local physical stores, um, getting the key role in online payments. For example. In Brazil, we have Boleto Bancario, which is very, very popular there. Um, Boleto, for those of you who don't know, is a payment method that enables you to pay for a payment slip that you either print or save on your phone um, from almost anywhere. There are hundreds of available locations in every neighborhood where users can go there, make these payments. Um, another payment method that I believe is worth mentioning and that we've had here at Exola that has vastly grown since we've had it is uh, PIX. Uh, PIX is a QR code payment method that now covers all the needs of all banked and unbanked um, populations because it's simple. You can pay the invoice both in cash and online with your bank account. I believe that the intention here is to enable people to support their favorite developers in whatever way that they can pay and not just with credit cards. Hey, Roy, there's a couple countries in your territory, specifically Turkey and India, or Indonesia, excuse me, that are of significance and that we've been working on. So why don't you expand on that? Right, right. Uh, yeah, Turkey and Indonesia, two uh, interesting countries that, that do business a little differently. Um, yeah, so Turkey has historically developed a wide network of alternative payment methods. They have initial prepaid cards, they have online bank transfers, uh, mobile payments are very popular there. Um, actually, those three method, methods each represent about 15% of the market share in, in Turkey, which is, which is very significant. Another thing to consider in Turkey is the, the Turkish lira, the, the local currency, um, often fluctuates. So when you um, make a decision to launch a game in, in this market, you have to make sure that you have access to very accurate and detailed reporting to try and understand what is the additional cost associated with conversions. Um, and, and the fact is that it's very similar in many emerging markets. It's not just there. Um, Indonesia is also an interesting country because of digital wallets that we've, we haven't mentioned yet. So we've seen digital wallets um, growing as a trend over the past three, four years. Um, in Asia today, um, you could expect to find two to three, I think on average, digital wallet in every country, and Indonesia surprisingly has over 50. So while it sounds a little over the top, it, it gives consumers in Indonesia a lot of flexibility to choose which wallets they want to use for which purchases, taking advantage of specific incentives that those wallets may, may, may provide them. So I think the bottom line is that emerging markets, Indonesia, Turkey, providing credit cards only would definitely not be enough. Those were some really good points. Really appreciate uh, expanding there. So it looks like after everything we've been talking about, the goal is just to maximize the number of payment methods around the world, right? Sounds simple but it seems like there could be some complications that kind of go with that. Zach, why don't you expand on some of that? Uh, let me think for a second. Uh, let's see. Well, hypothetically, uh, you could, right. but that's a lot of resources and expertise that you're going to have to build out uh, to support additional payment methods by yourself. There are new payment methods launching all the time. You know, some are we're used to in the gaming industry, some are brand new uh, that have rules and regulations that you have to abide to. Um, and also consider uh, when, when choosing these payment providers. Um, when we, we, we talk about that, uh, you know, we want to make sure that you, know, you have the tools and support for it. Unless you have a big team that's devoted to growing that payments portfolio, uh, you're still going to need to prioritize some of the specifics uh, and know that market very well. You know, some questions you might ponder could be, you know, where are my profits coming from? 
Um, you know, how will I handle multiple contracts? How will I handle you know multiple integrations with all the payment providers? You know that are going to be routinely updated every single day. Uh, you know, we've also seen payment providers and many providers tend to have specific terms uh, that you have to comply with before launch. And, uh, you know, for developers and publishers, that's just extra work you really don't want to deal with. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm speaking for most of the crowd out there. Um, but yeah, Berkeley, I think that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, the, the local requirements is really a big deal. And I know another country that we're, we're going to bounce over to and... Uh, Get, let Roy jump in here on is on Japan after spending a lot of time in there myself I know that's a really big deal about the local terms Yep, it is Berkeley. Thank you. I, I was hoping that you would not ask me the Japan <laughs> question, but uh, yeah, Japan is quite complicated um, I'll, I'll kind of like try and touch base on it um, You know high level so, you know in, in Japan if you want to launch and release your game in 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 this country Then you have to meet pretty strict strict list of, of governmental requirements uh, in order to to sell there, right? So I mean, the main one is that everything needs to be in Japanese. It needs to be localized, um, and and you need to have Japanese speaking support. Um, you need to hire additional staff in order to uh, to support that in, in in the country, and you have to be compliant with with multiple Japanese laws. Um, and to do that, you need to connect to you know to the local office in in in, in this area. Another thing is that you need to uh, create a localized SCTL page on your official website and openly disclose the contact information of your business so that Japanese customers can contact you if they encounter any type of payment issues. We have the same thing in Germany, actually. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's another example of, of like, to, just to see like how um, complicated or just not so simple these, some of these markets are and like when you really want to launch anywhere outside the markets that we understand more like like the US there needs to be more attention paid to these things now um, India is, is, is another is another market that, that's interesting in this regard it as a matter of fact it took I think Exola almost four years to uh, establish our our business in in um, in India um, because it requires some additional hoops to, uh, to jump through. So you need to really open, establish a local presence in India. So you need to open an office um, that has a physical address. You need to then um, hire a director to um, manage this office and basically manage the communication with all of the um, tax or, or law offices. Another interesting thing about India is that there's a tremendous sensitivity to, that, that, to games and, and specifically to chance games. Right, so they, they, do not, they do not allow that, um, and therefore you have to make sure that um, your game will not qual qualify as a game of chance in any of the regions in India. Um, the, order, the onboarding process is also quite complicated, so it requires a strict KYC. Um, so I think that the conclusion is that if you do want to launch in this market, then doing so without a merchant of record support means that you need to anticipate those difficulties. They're definitely going to be there. Um, and you have to deal with a lot of local compliance and ensure that that does not actually mess up your, your game launch. Speaking of some compliances, there's a few challenges you have in, in Europe, Sebastian. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I would say that these things, just, uh, they don't apply just to you know, growth markets like India or Japan, what Roy was just talking about. Um, Basically, Europe, uh, you know, you have a lot of those as well. I mean, it's always an obvious choice for uh, most game developers to want to do business in Europe because it's such a, an important area uh, on the planet. Um, but, you know, there's personal data laws introduced like GDPA or CCPA all the time, and, and Europe is no exception. Um, and then I think also another big thing is that a lot of people think of Europe as like this one region that you just can go in and you have access to all the countries right uh, at the same time with the same strategy. But that's just not how it works, right? So, if, um, just talking, uh, looking at payments, you know, you you have to have a strategy set for all the countries because the the most popular payment methods uh, in these countries they vary. Um, you know, like the the payment methods I talked about before, Blick in Poland, I've never used it in my life in Germany. It's not it's not a thing, right? So you can't just expect to just have one set and then you're ready to go across Europe. And then another thing is taxes, um, which can become a problem. Um, I mean, if you're already doing uh, business in Europe, you probably know, but 
um, you, know, um, you need to file taxes in the country where your customer lives and pays from and not where your company is set up in. So, you know, these things come with a lot of overhead and uh, additional work that you have to be prepared to, you know, dive into. Um, so, definitely also some challenges here. That's a ton of things to keep in mind while you're thinking about your payment strategy overall. You know, thinking about the list and everything that we've been talking about here, but what would you prioritize first? What would be your first step, Zach? Um, well, let me get comfortable. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you'll be here for a while. Uh, well, first off, you got to prioritize a great game. Um, but we all care about our audience. Uh, our audience is, you know, best when they're happy. And our advice is very simple: uh, to put the customer experience first. And there's two steps really to it. One is a simplified, you know, payment system and payment flow, and the other one is localization. For, so we'll start off with um, you know the key payment methods for each country. Like you need to have that to you know make sure you're offering in the regional price. Uh, we see that very popular amongst the developing economies of certain countries, um, and you know setting those prices up in the local currencies is also a big must. Uh, as Roy kind of alluded to, you know some countries like Japan. There is a governmental incentive uh, to have it be in the Japanese yen, so uh, definitely double check that and, and make sure that you're, you're, you're complying to that. But we also recommend that you do this for all your target territories. Uh, we want you to make sure that the local provider can you know, process these payments and these currencies for those countries. And this way, you know, users will not be charged that extra uh, currency fee. Uh, as myself, as a user, uh, I don't like anything outside of maybe the tax. Um, you know, it's not, you know, I don't like, I don't like paying extra. Uh, and, you know, I also got to be sure to localize uh, the checkout interfaces. Uh, that's a, a huge must. You know, not every uh, gamer is English speaking, of course, and you want them to be confident and comfortable with their purchases. And that kind of leads us to like the last thing, and it's and, and probably the most important thing for myself is the one-click payments. Uh, I play a lot of Magic. Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that, but I play a lot of Magic, and it's uh, amazing when I can just uh, put in my payment information, and then each time you know a new pass comes out or or jewels or gems and whatnot, I can just click to to, to purchase it. Uh, do I have buyer's remorse sometimes? Um, but you know the, these uh, these are just the you know a little bit of the the way the world runs uh, when it comes to using Exola, and, and we want to make it as seamless as possible. Um, but your thoughts, Roy? Yep. So I think that um, definitely um, audience user experiences is important. I totally agree with that. Um, but you know I, I want to add that uh, you know what I'm hearing and, and we're hearing that a lot. I think all of us is that. They're a key thing uh, for customers is security, right? And no, not everyone is able to input their, you know, personal credentials online and, and, and feel secure about it. Um, and, you know, one way to try and solve that is to try and offer um, some risk-free payment um, methods wherever they're available. Like an example could be um, like what we do in, in, in Brazil when when users can enter their payment details online, uh, they can initiate the payment online, again, then they get a slip that they can then use to further pay in cash wherever they want. Um, the, the same thing happens in, in, in Japan, like using Konbini, for example. This is kind of like the same, the same thing. Another, another thing to um, think about, which is essential, is to implement a substantial anti-fraud system um, and this is something at Exola that, that, that we did, and, and we have um, a pretty um, impressive technology that does that. But really, whatever solution you choose for anti-fraud, like make sure that it has some element of machine learning to it that can actually very thoroughly check and come for fraudulent activity in the game, and you'll be able to block serial fraudsters this way. So people who attempt to buy um, you know, games or in-game items using um, stolen credit cards um, and, and in multiple games, which makes it even like easier to trace and, and, and to catch, and the ability to set filters so that um, you could match, you know, this, for the specifics of your game, like, you know, use of in-game parameters um, to determine whether the transaction is fraudulent or not. 
And kind of along with what you were saying, Roy, along with the ability to set up in-game parameters, I would also like to add that you, that you should also make sure that your customers know that if anything that goes wrong, they can always talk to the customer support team. Now, I did it before I was doing BD and being up here talking to you guys. I was doing customer service for three years. So in those three years, I was able to really get a good grasp of what the user issues are, why their payments are being completed. Sometimes it could be an issue uh, on the game, or more times it could be an issue on their payment side. Um, customer support has always been a great influence on customer satisfaction, user retention, and the number of used uh, issued chargebacks. Um, the one thing that it's very important, and I think, sorry to put you guys away, but I think specifically for Latin America, being a merchant of record is honestly the most important thing. Because the last thing a Latin, a Latin American developers, and keep in mind, most of these most of these developers are barely getting into the video game industry. So most, most of, they don't really know, oh, what are taxes? How do I deal with COPA compliance? How do I deal with GDPR? How do I deal with all of these things? By having company like Exola and having them explain that all they have to worry about is basically their game, it absolutely eases, eases their, their mind. And, and that's pretty much what I think all of us preach is we're going to handle all the taxes, we're going to handle the headaches so that you guys can just break out the game as, 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 best, as, it, as best as it can be. And what we have seen in that experience um, is that most of the customer inquiries can be resolved while maintaining that satisfaction. Um, in fact, most of those cases are treated individually, whether it's a refund request, a bug, or a payment issue, um, like I mentioned before. Um, but one thing I, I would like to mention here before I uh, pass it off to Berkeley is that once you start going into different territories, you're going to really start to think about like, okay, m now I may have to think about having different support in different languages. Luckily for everyone here, Exola has a customer support team that's on the clock 24-7, 365 days. Um, and we have various um, different languages that we pretty much have covered, Japanese, Spanish, Portuguese. Um, I think there's probably a few others that we have. So, And we're definitely working on having more because, like I said, having that customer experience just from that point of view goes a long way. And, you know, who kn the, the possibilities are endless after, after that. For sure. Thank you guys for all your notes. And like coming back to the payment side of things, and for this audience here specifically who are forward thinking, like let's look at our crystal balls for a second. It was like, what are the, some of the things that you're keeping your eyes on as we go forward? Sure. I mean, it's, it's always a difficult thing to just try to figure out like, how much money I'm going to be making once I hit in this in this new territory? What can I expect? Is it worth my time? Should we even do it? Um, especially without knowing that specific game data, right? Um, but what we can say here with certainty is that it would definitely um, improve your ROI, a return on investment. And from what we've seen from our experience is that um, we've seen at least 30% growth um, and more per territory by simply adding alternative payment methods um, to international credit cards. Again, don't just have credit cards, enable alternative payment methods. Um, by opening up to new markets, it's the simplest way to get more users and embrace new digital distribution opportunities. Now, it doesn't have to be complicated in case you decide to delegate part of the operational work to the merchant of record, which would be Exol in this case, and pick a payment partner that can offer you a complex solution in your target countries. Some developers go that route, others decide to just stick with Exola. It's totally up to you. Um, but just, actually now, now that I kind of think about it, Zach, didn't we do something like this for, um, uh, who is it, Nexters? If I'm not mistaken? Yes, yes. Shout out to Nexters. Shout uh, out Nexters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is something we have done with Nexters, especially, uh, specifically actually for uh, Hero War. So during 2018, 2020, uh, the game definitely grew rapidly on the iOS and Android. Uh, they hit up, I think, I believe 100 million cumulative installs, uh, becoming one of the most popular mobile RPGs out there. You know, while Hero Wars, achieve that amazing success on mobile. Nexters was trying you know, con to consider other platforms to go to, uh, just to you know, boost up their margins, find new audiences. And uh, luckily in 2020, one of the options was to expand to the web with Exola. So they pretty much brought the focus point not only to the mobile sphere, but also to the web. The results were definitely remarkable. Um, Hero Wars was able to multiply, you know, their revenue, their sales dramatically increased, and, you know, by expanding there, uh, they 
grew past that mobile uh, app stores that we see. Uh, they're typically now taking a lot of the profit away from these developers. The, the best part about it was they still maintain full control of their audience and, and really was able to you know, give back to them. And some of those key integrations that we did with them was offering that 700 plus payment methods along with the 240 alternative ones that we have kind of you know, touched on uh, in this conversation. And uh, you know, we were able to also give them the, you know, different tools. Uh, regions like Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, we were able to you know, help them with the local coverage for tax management. And last but not least, you know, we uh, lower their chargebacks. And I guess I'm the chargeback guy because I'm the one who said it like multiple times. But uh, you know, with the integration of our pay station and our anti-fraud, uh, we really help them uh, lower that that, that those fees. So um, you know, we're built for the game companies and we're built for the video game industry. Thanks for thanks for sharing that story that we're, how we did a. Great integration with Nexter is one of our partners. But let's talk about some other things that are new, and as we talk about looking at the crystal ball, new digital distribution opportunities, um, and what we have that we've been working on. Why don't you share some of that, Roy? Right, yeah. So distribution is, uh, is a really interesting challenge that um, all developers face once their game is out there, right? So while, while some of you will develop games for mobile games, then you will rely on iOS and, and the Android store to market your games or to showcase them. Um, if you have a PC game, then you will most likely sell on you know, storefronts like Steam if it's here or like even do it yourselves. So distribution definitely becomes a an interesting challenge to have, and in, and in many cases frustrating, because as you know, uh, it's difficult to get exposure. Like in a world where there are like millions of games out there, and you know, your game may be seen for like half a week every six months uh, on a storefront, which is usually not enough for most developers to generate the revenue that they want. So, you know, at Exola, we've been kind of like I, we identified and we've been following this trend of what you know what we like to call super apps over the past two plus years. Um, and super apps is, is really interesting because it ties directly into distribution and, and, and shows or poses an, a distribution opportunity for, for game developers. So a super app is basically an app that does more than just what you think it would do, right? So it, it basically expands on its core business. Um, so Instead of an app that only uses um, your information and allows you to pay with credit cards for whatever you want, imagine an app that can do more than that. An app that you open and can you know, allow you to pay for taxi, order food, pay for your utilities. So here in America, for example, imagine that um, you would log into your Verizon app, AT&T, um, T-Mobile, whatever, and in this app, you'd be able to do more than just check out your, you know, your monthly bill or, or pay for it. Um, you'd also be able to buy games or purchase in-game items or downloadable content. So this ability to basically connect um, vendors and, and games together through the use of a super app, which is becoming very popular, is something that we do and is an, an amazing way for for developers to get their games to the hands of people um, that are not necessarily going to find them on, on the, the mobile stores or on Steam or wherever that is. Also, maybe just like very quickly, last point is that by, by doing or creating those business opportunities, usually super apps would provide some additional perks or incentives. So like you would be able to get some exclusive content or exp whatever that is, if you do purchase or top up your account from within this super app. So definitely exciting. Um, I mean, if you haven't, you should check what we do have online in our digital distribution hub, which is exactly this marketplace that allows for this like cross-pollination of vendors and, and, and game devs. Well, thank you guys so much. This was so much to soak in, a lot of topics. We bounced around the world um, talking about everything today. So thank you, Zach, Roy, Sebastian, and Jurgen, really intuitive conversation and dialogue back and forth. I'm sure we could go on and on about the different opportunities to help people publish, launch, and grow their games. We'll be sticking around here afterwards for a little Q&A, kind of up here up front. Um, but starting tomorrow, come by our booth. Um, they're in the South Hall at uh, S657, and we can talk about how we can help you reach new players, new markets. But before we close out, we wanted to show you a few great examples and a visual representation of our flagship payment solution, where we're gonna help you deliver an integrated payment experience 
Our core PlayStation product is a foundation that helps enable game developers to reach players in 200 plus countries around the world, 700 different payment methods, and in over 20 languages. You're, you jumped on some of those earlier when we were talking about the- yeah, I beat you to it. <laughs> and, and we wanted to give you a sneak peek of what's to come. So thank you guys for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Have a great GDC 2022 and enjoy the game. Enjoy new payment possibilities. Enjoy more per transaction. Enjoy expanding into new worlds. Enjoy it all across mobile, PC, and web. Enjoy the game. Welcome to Exola, a global video game commerce company.